Welcome back to another edition of Higher Education Today. I'm your host, Stephen Roy Goodman. I'm here at the University of Cape Town. Where we're going to be speaking about connections with ancestors. Heather McAllister is a genealogical researcher here in South Africa. Benita Bennett is director of the District 6 Museum. And Christy Fonsell is a Sangoma, which is a traditional healer. Welcome to all of you. Thank, thank you, you, Stephen. Thank you, Steve. Well, thank you for coming on the show. Uh, Heather, maybe if we can start with you. Uh, you're a professional genealogical researcher, and if I understood that correctly, that means that somebody would essentially hire you to do research about their family background, is that right? That's correct. They normally come to me if, they, if it's a, something that they stuck or they can't do on their own, or if they just purely they don't have the time to do it, then they would be quite happy to pay somebody else to do it. Otherwise, they can go and do it on their own and find their own resources and trace their family history themselves. And why would someone want to do that? Well, it could be a number of reasons. Um, I always ask people, why, why, why do you want to do it? Uh, is it for adoption? Is it for immigration purposes? A lot of people are immigrating and they need proof of their family's ancestry. Or is it um, a family rumor that could be, there, there's a story that they need to find out that their grandfather was a ship's captain or he jumped ship or he came from somewhere that they don't know about and they just need to actually find out where they came from. Well, speaking of where one comes from, Benita, you uh, run a museum and I've actually been to your museum. You run a museum that captures the essence of a place where people came from but no longer uh, basically no longer exists in the way that it was back in the day. That's right, yes. And so this community was a very diverse community, um, dating back to the 1800s. It was an inner city neighborhood called District 6. And many years later, with the advent of, of apartheid in 1948, the community was forcibly removed from, from that place. But they kept the memory alive, and so there was always a sense of the diaspora, but that's always connected to the place. And so it's kind of, I suppose it's a different kind of connectivity than through DNA um, and rebuilding the kind of community coherence through connecting with each other in this period of restitution. That's been an important focus, both of the museum, but also of the community. That's interesting. And then speaking of connections with one another, Christy, you are a Sangoma. And if I understand that correctly, that means that you have a connection to your ancestors and you help people to tie into their ancestors in some way. That's correct, Steve. Um, as Sangomas, we are vessels. We are mediums between the physical world and the spiritual world. So we the people that would perhaps make spur people in Heather's direction to try and find out what was the stories with their ancestors, if for instance we couldn't find it. But we are the people that are able to transcend the physical realm we can connect with our ancestors to connect with someone else's ancestors and tell us what's going on in their lives holistically, mentally, physically, emotionally, in their soul, in their spirit, um, which they then let us know what the history of their ancestry was and what's going on, perhaps something like generational curses or practices that the family stopped doing that could be helping that person live a better life. But what if somebody encounters a, a, an ancestor who they're not particularly proud of, let's say? Well, what we'd usually then do is we would intercede and we would find out what that ancestor needs. Because usually the ancestors come back um, through us into the physical realm again, because usually there's atonement that needs to happen, or there are practices that they need to bring back into your life that could bring uh, well-being into your life again. So if there's an ancestor that you're not necessarily proud of, we then try to find out if it's, there's a, there's a, there's a case called, there's something called ukufemba, which is basically removing negative spirits or dark spirits from your system, or we find out what that ancestor came back into the physical realm for, and we try to appease it, appease it without causing any disruption. That's really interesting, but how would you do that, and Benita, maybe if I can ask you, how would you do that from a museum standpoint if somebody discovers something that happened to District 6 that perhaps they didn't know before? We try to be that space we, to help people to discover it in different ways, and so it feels like a coming together of both the kind of spiritual realm, that, that connectivity, 
some biology and DNA, but a lot of, of my work is about social history, community coherence, and very much relational as well. And so we work so much with narrative, and through our narrative and our oral history collection, it is helping people to make those connections. In fact, not to make those connections, because they are there and people are very conscious of it, but to kind of make it known um, what that connection is. And so we, as a museum, might not have the capacity to help people to do what um, Christy as a, as a Sangoma does, but we would refer people to different, we might refer them to a Sangoma or to some other kind of spiritual leader or spiritual guidance, if that is what it feels like they need. So we're part of that conversation and not the experts in everything that bring people to connectivity. Well, this issue of connectivity is really interesting yes. because when, you know, I'm not from South Africa, so I'm only seeing this from the outside, even yes. though I know you know, something about South Africa, but I'm interested in, in how different people in South Africa look at ancestors. It, from where I sit, it seems that people look at it in very different ways. Very, very different ways. And I'm sure Christy can probably speak a bit, bit more about that. But from my point of view, I've been quite ambivalent, to be very honest, over time in terms of not so much ancestry, but the whole thing of looking at the DNA re research for example. So I know a lot of people around me, colleagues and family and friends, are on this journey for finding out who they are, where they fit in, who they're connected to, and some, some of them have followed the, the route of DNA research. But this, and this is just a very, it's a, a combination probably of my museum voice and my personal voice as well, where I found that when people find out, for example, that they have a stronger Khoisan connection, then that becomes the sole identity and they focus on the kind of Khoisan part of it. And other people, they discover maybe there's the Malaysian part and they would focus on that to the exclusion of all the other parts. And so my stance for a long time, and I, it's not permanent, I might change, my stance for a long time is I am not, I actually don't want to do the DNA research at this point because I love the imagination. So I can imagine I'm connected to, I feel connected to Cape Town's history in a large way. I think I'm connected to Khoisan, there's Malaysian, there's Filipino. I'm picking up on the narrative from my family. And I love at the moment that it helps me to connect with different communities. So, and different strains. Um, it might not be scientifically accurate, but I think I'm trying to find that space of connecting all the ways of how we make our identity. And it's not only biology. Well, that is interesting. And uh, Heather, in terms of the identity, when people come to, see, to you to chat about identity, they're not really coming to chat, they're actually coming to research their identity. That's, that's right, they, they actually want to see physical documentation and on black, black and white um, where their family came from. But there, there's always a problem in, in documents that sometimes it's not what you actually see on the documents because over time, pe people are human, they make mistakes and whoever's filled in like a for example, a, a death notice, which is a form uh, normally encompassed in the deceased estate of somebody. And it'll have the pers deceased person's name and it'll have their place of birth and their parents' names. Now, whoever fills the form in, it depends how well they knew the deceased, is the deceased person. So it could be the postman that filled in the form and he doesn't know where you actually come from and he just puts any old thing in. The same as your parents' names, he might think that your father was John, but actually he was James. And so therefore, already that document might be incorrect. So you need to have more, another document to prove that that document is actually correct as well. So it's actually quite interesting that you need to have all these different types of documents just to prove one fact. Mm. But what about the issue of oral tradition? My understanding is that there are a number of communities in South Africa where the oral tradition is, is very strong, perhaps even stronger than the written one. There are a lot of people that do the oral traditions and I'm a firm believer in, you know, in every family history, there's always an ounce of truth. So there can be the oral history, can be a lot of truth in it, but sometimes they can also pass down a lot of mistakes and errors and Kirstie, do you have a thought or two about this in terms of people when they're coming to chat or connect with their ancestors, maybe they're discovering things, as Heather just said, that, that, mm -hmm. that they thought were, happened to be true, but mm -hmm. maybe wasn't true, isn't true? Mm -hmm. Absolutely true. Um, 
the the thing about it is that what happens when we connect uh, with the ancestors is we're connecting with also the memory of lineage. Usually what happens with that is that I will get shown perhaps spirits, like I'll talk about my experience, I'm being shown a lot of the spirits from my father's side of the family and I had no connection with my father's side of the family. I have a lot of faces that I know now from my dreams or from my visions uh, but then I become the person that would go to Heather to be like can I find the history of my father's family or it then becomes an organic process where through learning how to communicate with my ancestors, it's called Upatla in Awanguni languages, it's called Upatla and we use uh, certain rituals to get closer to our connection with our ancestors and then they show us. I mean, I have spiritual sisters that have come to find out through their dreams and their visions where their ancestors, their great, great grandfathers would rock up in a dream and would be asking, why is it that you are doing rituals and calling out these certain clan names when your clan names are actually A, B, and C. And then they have to now go back to their families that they know raised them as under a certain clan name and be questioning why is it that we've been using this clan name? Because in my dream, an ancestor that looks like, perhaps now looks like my father that is still alive. I saw a man in my dream who looks like you, who was asking me, why is it that we've been using this clan name and this tribal name to do ceremonies and rituals for me to appease my ancestors, when in actual fact, this is not my tribal or clan name? where it was a case of perhaps I had to be adopted or I had to be raised by other family members that have a different surname and they had to, they had to um, adopt me and use their surname or they raised me and, as not my parents but I had to use their surname to gain access to certain things while I was living with them. So now I have to unravel all of that history and figure out how it came, that, how it came to that. But what the ancestor will do is show me what I need to do to undo the consequences of that. But I imagine that that could be quite emotional for somebody. Yes, it is. It is quite an emotional process. And we often try to, I mean, as Sangomas, we take care of the entire well-being, uh, the spectrum of the entire well-being, because in African belief systems and a lot of other belief systems I've come to learn um, since I started on my journey as a Sangoma, actually have a way to take care of your wellness holistically. So it takes care of your mental, your emotional, your physical, your spiritual self, which are things that are no longer taken care of in the modern day context. I am currently working with tertiary institutions like UCT to try and figure out how they can accommodate a different kind of wellness that doesn't only look at mental and physical health, but that looks at other forms of health that are taken care of, perhaps through our belief systems, but they are not catered for because uh, in Western medicine, the Western medicine concept that we work under, those things are not seen as valid. So they need to be validated, you know, through some kind of Western system, which then nullifies basically the experience of the existence of the African belief system. The work that comes with revealing that to someone that kind of information means that I also become a social worker and a counsellor, even in the seat of being a Sangoma. Because in pre-colonial times, we were the people that took care of uh, the, the community wellness for everybody to be okay. We connect you to everything that, that keeps you sane and keeps you your well-being up to date, per se. And there probably were Sangomas then in District 6. They were, they were. I think people found different ways or, or different pathways, as, as Christy mentioned, to their own healing. So it was a, because it was such a diverse community, people coming from all over. Um, there were, yeah, there were shaman, there were, there were sangomas, there were priests, there were rabbis, there were imams. There were people who also had different, more secular ways of finding their paths. And they also found a way to, to be respectful towards each other, not work exclusively. And I think there was a lot of sharing, I mean, across. People didn't only go to Sangoma, mm. and they didn't only go to, um, you know, Malay culture. I'm trying to find the right word, but there's a, 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 usually a woman that they would call the slim fro that people would go to and also for some. So there would be a combination of Christian, African, all coming together. And I think just to say that was part of the 
the sadness and the example of District 6 was that capacity to really work together and live together as a community, which apartheid has made us forget that it is possible. Interesting. And then in terms of the training to how we would do some of this research, uh, maybe I could ask this all to all of you, is how did you train, maybe Heather, maybe we could start with you, how did you become a genealogical researcher? Uh, does one just go to genealogical research at a university? How do you train to do that? Well, I personally don't have any formal training. Um, it's something that I've had a, a lifelong passion for and I've been in the industry now for about 34 years and whatever I know today I've taught myself or other people have helped me but there's in South Africa there's actually no way where you can actually train to become a, ge a, a genealogist. There's no formal course or training. Um, there are quite a few gene professional genealogists around but nobody offers an, an actual course on how to become a genealogist in South Africa. And is there an association? There are genealogical societies that you can belong to. Yes, there's the um, South African Genealogical Society. There's the Cape Town Family History Society. Um, most provinces have small family history societies where you can join and they have monthly meetings. Um, they have guest speakers and they have little wor workshops that you can go to to learn how to do your family history. Fair enough. And Christy, if you don't mind me asking, I don't, I don't hope this isn't a rude question, but how does one become a Sangoma? <laughs> okay, so you, it's, mm. it's, you get the calling, right? And there are many symptoms that come with getting the calling. And in my case, I mean, I can only speak from my experience. Yes, there are people with similar experiences, but I'd rather speak from the perspective of my own experience. My life started falling apart, literally. I was unable to make money. I was unable to write exams at school. I was having terribly destructive relationships. I got kicked out of home. Um, I lost my parents. I went through a lot of domestic and sexual abuse. And when it, when, when it came to a point where I was no longer able to engage any part of my life because it was too traumatic to engage any part of my life, I went to a friend of mine who had also had the calling and she recognized the symptoms and she said to me, you have a calling, you should probably go and try and visit a Sangoma. Now that's not something that I was raised to understand. We did do, do um, ceremonies at home, we did coming of age ceremonies, we did um, a ceremonies to show gratitude to the ancestors but we were never told the extent of culture and how much we actually needed to do as much as we did things like in Belego where you get introduced to the ancestors um, we weren't told the extent of what it means to take care of your wellness according to African indigenous knowledge so when I got the calling, I was shocked out of my wits because I was raised in the Catholic Church, you know. I lived all my life as a Catholic until I turned 20 and my life absolutely started falling apart and I couldn't do anything. And a friend of mine said, I had the same thing when I was 19, you should probably go and try and see a Sangoma. And then all of a sudden I found myself surrounded by a whole bunch of Sangomas and they were all saying the same thing. Um, and this is, these are not people that were having conversations with each other or that had heard me have a conversation with another person. They just stood there and they were like, dude, you need to connect with your ancestors. You need to do something where you have a conversation with them and find out what's wrong. And when I went to a Sangoma to go and consult, they said to me, your ancestors are trying to pass gifts onto you. They're trying to pass blessings onto you. They are trying to protect you, but there are certain ceremonies and rituals that you need to do, and there's a training that you need to go through, which, which as Izangoma, we go through a training called Indwaso, which is basically initiation, where once you have found out that you have the calling, you've established that you have the calling, then you begin a cleansing process uh, that involves purging, steaming, uh, cleansing in rivers and the, and the oceans where you use those processes to cleanse your system so that you can connect with your ancestors again. And we very much believe in cleansing and purity um, as part of the African Indigenous 
uh, knowledge systems, the cleansing and purity doesn't only happen mentally through meditation, emotionally through um, meditation or letting go of negative energy, but also physically, because we hold, like Buddhists would say, we hold energy in our bodies. So we hold negative energy and blockages in our bodies, and we need to get rid of them. And like in Buddhism, you would meditate it out of your system. But we have physical ways that you can get rid of it through purging, through certain herbal medicines that you would take that would put you through a cleansing process. And then the ancestors are then able to connect with you because you are now an empty vessel. You, you are no longer filled with all of the negative energy of the things that you've encountered in the physical world and the blockages that you've inherited from your ancestors in the spiritual world. So for us to undo those things first, and then you carry on with the process of continuing to communicate in your own personal space, um, which is basically burning in Bebo, which is the equivalent for you guys is what you would call sage, but it's also an African plant that grows wild. We use candles, we use um, certain kinds of uh, devotive things, like the things that our ancestors used to like, like certain drinks, they used to like certain foods. Um, we would slaughter chickens, we'd slaughter animals, um, which are the things that are appeasement for them. Um, and we would let them know what we're doing this ritual for, or we let them know if it's in your own personal space, what you're trying to communicate with them. You ask them to show you where you need to go so that you can get the guidance that they want you to get. Um, so that you're able to get those gifts and then it removes a lot of the mayhem from your life because the saying says that uh, your, your calling only becomes baggage to you if you are not paying attention to it. Because that's when it causes blockages, when they're trying to get to you, they're trying to give you messages, they're trying to communicate with you, they're trying to protect you, but they can't because there's a lot of this dark energy that's surrounding you and they need to remove that so that they can show you what it is that they're trying to give you. Well, thank you for sharing that. Um, I guess my thought on that is kind of in relation to what Heather does, because it seems to me that people are coming to you almost in the opposite way. They're kind of looking back, but you're saying you're going in one direction, you're going in another direction. Am I interpreting this correctly? Correct, um, but we, you know, People that come to me, they also have a lot of family, um, what do you call it, traditions and things from the past that they carry on in their family, whether it be clothes, traditions, food, songs, all those sort of things. We all look at those items when you're tracing your family history as well, which is probably very much the, the same as what you're doing as well. And trying to gain, like, usually it would be, be trying to gauge, like, an understanding of where does that thing come from? Correct. What was the start of it? What is the point of it? Why mm. should I have to carry it on? Because then, obviously, in your dreams and your visions, you've been told there's this thing that you need to do, but you have no clue. Because possibly, maybe the generation before you, like your parents or your grandparents, stopped practicing it for some reason. And then you go back into all of that information to figure out why are my ancestors telling me I need to do this thing? And I imagine that with Heather, it's the same thing when she unfolds uh, people's family lineage because then they get to figure out where did that thing start and what was the point of it and, you know, how does it relate to the modern context? Well, how, how does this relate to the modern context? Uh, if I could ask all of you to kind of pretend that we were having this discussion not in Cape Town but in Washington, D.C. or in New York or somewhere in the United States. As you can imagine, this might be a kind of unusual discussion from a Western perspective. What would you say to an, to an, uh, an American viewer watching this and saying, wow, this is a very different way than I relate to my family history? I would say that it has to be something that you feel. Um, it has to be something that, you've, something that your gut spurs you towards doing. Because as much as I was told that I had the calling, there is something in your intuition that tells you whether you should be going in that direction or not. And that's something that we're not taught anymore. Um, Pre-colonial times, we were a people that this was a lifestyle. This wasn't, you know, um, you do a ceremony when the ancestors like only show you or there's mayhem in your life or et cetera, et cetera. It was a lifestyle. It was constant. It was like, it was religious, you know, and that's why also people would equate it to religion. I would say 
never underestimate the value of narrative, personal narrative, family narratives, and personal experiences as well, because that's also a source of history. And I think formal history, documented history, together with family histories, I think is what contributes to a broader understanding of the past and who we are in the world. And so I would really encourage people to listen to your family stories that might irritate you at some time. You know, you're hearing the story over and over. I know from experience and I'm sorry that I didn't listen well enough. If, if I knew what I know now when I was 16 or 18 years old, I would be asking different questions of some of my family members and community members who have passed away. Um, so I would just say really don't undervalue different sources of knowledge because it's not only the formal knowledge and the academic knowledge that, that counts. It's how all of these different knowledges and different sources of expertise come together. I also think we, we need to respect everyone's cultures and their backgrounds because everybody's family history is completely different and I don't think there's any particular way that one should actually trace your family history. Everybody should do the way that they were maybe brought up to do. Some of them have the oral traditions, some of them have the traditions of the piece of paper that you trace your family history and other people have different ways of tracing their family history and I think it's, you know, we have to respect everybody's religious backgrounds, their ethnic backgrounds, and we can all learn a little bit from one another in the end. Well, that's a great way to wrap this up. But before we do, just a very, f I think we have a few seconds left, uh, Heather. So where can someone go if they want to just do some basic research about their family? What online resources are there before they come to you or to a Sangoma or go to a museum? What, what basic work can they do quickly uh, online? Okay, they can, first of all, they can go to the National Archives website um, where they can find references. The documents are not online, but there's a website called familysearch.org, which is run by the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints, and they have millions of South African records that are now online that you can see physical documents, whether it be mar marriages, deaths, um, gosh, there's, there's a whole host, there's even slave records online now, and it covers most religions and every, all colors of the rainbow, everybody's included, and those would be the, the first two places that I would go to. Well, thank you for sharing that. If you would like additional information about Heather McAllister, Benita Bennett, or Christy Fonseil, please visit ancestors.co.za or district6.co.za or za.linkedin.com. If you have comments or suggestions about higher education today, please send an email to highereducationtoday at topcolleges.com. And thank you for watching. We will continue to bring you quality discussions about important matters in today's college and university world. I'm Stephen Roy Goodman, and you've been watching Higher Education Today.